We're going to deal today with the topic, Knowing and Following God's Will. This topic is very significant because many people will always ask the question, what is God's will? I've been 40 years in Adventism, and yet I have heard a lot of people, mature people, mature Christians, keep on asking what is the will of God. So we are going to discuss today at least stated will of God. But first, we'll understand that God's will is really of utmost importance. Jesus, our Lord, teaches us first in prayer that he wants us to follow the will of God the Father. In the prayer of Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It means to say the extent of God's will is to be done on heaven and earth. The government of his kingdom, God has his will to be obeyed and followed by his subject. But we need to understand the nature of God. The nature of God is love. It follows that everything in his government is based on love. As John 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for God is of God. And everyone who loves, born of God, and knows that he who does not, lo does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is the overall governing relationship of all its subject and in his kingdom. And so, we need to understand that God's government, we need to understand the nature of God's government because the nature of God also reflects the nature of his government. God's government is the manifestation of his inherent attributes and nature and character, such as love, righteousness, justice, mercy, and truth. So, 1 John 4.16 says, And we have known and believed that love that God has for us, God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. The book of Psalms says 85 verse 10, no, 89 verse 14, Righteousness, justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. And again in 85 verse 10 says, Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kiss. Meaning to say, the foundation of God's throne is righteousness, justice, mercy, truth. And this is the government of God. So the subject of his kingdom must conform to his nature and character and to be manifested is in the kingdom and his government. So God requires for the subject of his kingdom. In many places of the scripture, God declares what he requires of the inhabitants of his kingdom. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 4, 15. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. Now, this is really what God requires. If you love me, keep my commandment. If you desire to follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And again, in, in the Old Testament, it says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I commanded you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. The condition is voluntary or free will decision. 
Not by force, no coercion, but willingness. And Ellen White gave us a beautiful picture of what is the nature of God's government. Pachak and Prophets, page 34, the law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principle of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, service that spring forth from the appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience, and to all he grants freedom of will that they may render voluntary service. So, it means service of love, voluntary, no force, obedience. This is the government of God. And again, she says in Steps to Christ, page 44, God does not force the will of his creatures. He cannot accept a homage that is not willingly and intelligently given. A mere force submission would prevent all real development of the mind and character. It would make a man a mere automaton. Such is the purpose of the Creator. Here we understand that God's government and His nature it means voluntary, service of love, no coercion, no forced obedience. As such, he has given us that kind of willingness. So again, it says the rules given by God are to be observed and respected by even in every church. Nothing to be done by compulsion. All service is to be done willingly and for the love of service of God. All compelling power is to be found under Satan's government. God would not work in this line. So it is very clear. No forced obedience. It should be observed even in the church. Nothing to be done by compulsion. All service to be done willingly for the love of service. Because any compelling power is under Satan's government. And we don't want to reflect that kind manifestation in the administration of God's church. In manuscript releases, volume 18, 363 says, God does not force anyone. He leaves all free to choose. That's why we cannot say that God is arbitrary, so harsh. No. That is wrong reading of Scripture, wrong reading of His character, wrong reading of His government. Without freedom of choice, man's obedience would not have been voluntary but force. This is what Ellen White says in Patrick and Prophets, page 49. And again in the, in the book, Christ Triumphant, page 141. God has given the minds, the talents to mortal only in trust, on trial and to test, and prove them to see if they will work in his way and do his will, and put not confidence in themselves alone. Meaning to say, we have to understand that we who follow Christ must have really the mind of Christ because once we have the mind of Christ, we can obey God's will. So one's mind must be Christ's mind. First, the believer must possess the mind of Christ as Paul claims, but we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. The Christian mind should be transformed by renewing your mind that you may be proved what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. So the apostle declares that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because carnal mind is enmity against God, therefore cannot please God. Romans 8, verses 6 to 8. 
It means to say, a Christian who follow God's will must have the mind of Christ enwrote by the Holy Spirit. Because our mind that is worldly, carnal, is dead. Because the will of God is spiritually discerned. Because God is spiritual. So only spiritually minded people can do and obey God's will because they have set their mind on things above, not on things on earth. Colossians 3, 2. Already committed that this Christian will guard their hearts and mind through Christ, according to Paul in Philippians 4, 7. So meaning to say, carnal, worldly minds is utterly or utterly dangerous. Okay? In the book, our high calling, page 113 says, the natural, selfish mind if left to follow out its own will, own evil desire will act without high motives, without reference to the glory of God or the benefit of mankind, the thoughts will be evil and only evil continually. So this is the natural and carnal minds. The enemy of God has control. According to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, whose minds the God of this world age has blinded. So we need to be careful with our mind. Who takes control? I'm asking, is your mind, is the mind of Christ? Or the natural mind or the carnal mind? Ellen White says, many thoughts make up the unwritten history of a single day. And these thoughts have much to do with the formation of character. Our thoughts are to be strictly guarded. For one impure thought makes a deep impression on the soul. An evil thought leaves an evil impress in the mind. Messages to Young People, page 144. So the question is, is God's will difficult to find and follow? I said, yes, it is very difficult for a natural man or unconverted person to obey. For God's will is spiritually oriented. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 14. So only the genuine and true disciples of the Lord follow God's will, the profess are not. Only those who are born again could obey and follow God's will. It can be done only when Christ and the Holy Spirit dwell by faith in the converted person. Worldly Christians cannot follow God's will, for they are enemy of God for their Christianity is a lip service only. James says it categorically. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity against God? Enmity means hostility continually. There is no peace even at that or a comma. Whoever therefore wants to be friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4 verse 4. We need to be careful, my brothers and sisters, because this text is overlooked many, many by many Christians who profess to be followers of God, who says they are, going, they are going to follow God's will. Remember that. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, and whoever makes an enemy a friend of the world, he makes himself an enemy of God. There is no change with that principle. So we need to overcome barriers of personal sins, to renounce their own will, their chosen object of affection or pursuit require a sacrifice at which he seated and falter and to turn back. This is what Ellen White says. They desire, they desire the good. They make some effort to obtain it, but they do not choose it. They have not settled a purpose to secure it at all costs of things. The only hope for us if we would overcome 
is to unite our will to God's will. That's a challenge because we have our own will. But here, Ellen White is telling us, if we want to overcome the world, is to unite our will with God's will and work in cooperation with Him, hour by hour, day by day. In that sense, we cannot retain self and yet enter into the kingdom of God. If we ever attain unto holiness, it will be through renunciation of self and the reception of the mind of Christ. The pride, self-sufficiency must be crucified. The question, are we willing to pay the price required for us? Are we willing to have our will brought into a perfect conformity to the will of God? Amazing Grace 225. So this is something significant. It's easy to say to our mind, to our lips, Lord, I will follow your will, but unless our will is united with God's will, we cannot do it. The barriers are pride, self-sufficiency, our own personal and sins. These are the barrier of not obeying and following God's will. In fact, she continued in the Amazing Grace, he said, until we are willing, the transforming grace of God cannot manifest in us. Willingness to surrender. By becoming thoroughly acquainted with ourselves and then combining with the grace of God, a firm determination on our part. We may be conquerors and we become perfect in all things, wanting nothing. So there is a cooperation. And then, opposing circumstances, he continued, should create a firm determination to overcome them. The breaking down of one barrier will give greater ability and courage to go forward. Press with determination in the right direction, and circumstances will be your helpers, not your hindrances. True Christian character is marked by singleness of purpose. An indomitable determination which refuses to yield worldly influences which will aim at nothing short of the Bible standard. The consecration of Christ's follower must be complete. He must be willing to bear patiently, cheerfully, joyfully, whatever in God's providence he may be called to suffer. The same page, Amazing Grace 2, 25. It means to say, there must be a conflict, firm determination to stay in a right direction rather than follow our own inclination. Okay? Second Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love of sound mind. This is the gift of God that we may fulfill His will. Again, she said, in our high calling 94, the interests most vital to you individually are your own keeping. No one can damage them without your consent. All the satanic legions cannot injure you unless you open your soul to the arts and arrows of Satan. Your ruin can never take place until you will consent. If there is not a pollution of mind in yourself, all the surrounding pollution can attend or defile you. This is clear. That's why our mind should be the mind of Christ. This is what Paul, our will must be in harmony with God's will. Look at Isaiah 26.3. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace and whose mind stayed on you because he trusts in you. Our mind should stay on God and let us trust him. In his day, Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1105 says, Satan cannot touch the mind or intellect until we yield it to him. That's crucial. Because sometimes our mind runs anywhere. They are not controlled. They are not restricted. 
And so if our mind is not controlled by God and by His Holy Spirit, there's something wrong in us. And we cannot follow God's will. Because number one is we submit our mind, our will to God so that we can fulfill His will. This is a good thing. Ellen White says in Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 122-123, Satan cannot read minds, but he just observes. The adversary of soul is not permitted to read the thoughts of men, but he is a keen observer. He marks the words, he takes account of action, he skillfully adapts his temptation to meet the cases of those who place themselves in his power. If we would labor to repress sinful thoughts and feelings, giving them no expression in words or action, Satan would be defeated. He, will, he could not prepare his specious temptation to meet the case. But how open the professed Christian by the lack of self-control open the door to the adversary of souls. So here is. That's why our mind, our will, our feelings, our thoughts must be controlled. And we cannot control it unless we surrender it to the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to control us. This is the secret of following and obeying God's will. It means to say the role of the power of the will and the mind is the most important. Let's talk first about the human will. Then we will deal with the mind. For the will is the higher than the minds as we see it in Jesus. Jesus says, your will be done, not mine. Matthew 26, 39 and 42. Our will is to be yielded to him that we may receive it again. Purified, refined, and so link in sympathy with the divine that he can pour through us the tides of his love and power. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 61. The will of man is saved only when united with the will of God. Our high calling, page 104. The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. This is the governing power of the nature of man, the power of decision and of choice. Everything depends on right action of the will. Ministry of Healing 176. Meaning to say, our will is so important. We need to give it to God so that we can receive it. And according to Ellen White, when we receive it, it's already purified, refined. And God can work with us. But many times our will is so powerful rather than the will of God because we have the power of choice. The question is, did you study your will? Ellen White says in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, 513, you will be a constant peril until you understand the true force of the will. We are continually in danger when we do not understand our will. You may believe and promise all things, but your promises or your faith are of no value until you put your will on the side of faith and action. If you fight the fight of faith with all your willpower, you will conquer your feelings, your impression, your emotions, are not to be trusted, for they are not reliable. They are dangerous. And so Ellen White is saying that our will is always contrary to God. It's against to God's will. Our high calling ones, 53 reads, The will of man is aggressive and is constantly striving to bend all to its purposes. If it is enlisted on the side of God and right, the fruits of spirit will appear in life and God has appointed glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good. So we understand that. Compelling. 
constantly striving against the will of God. When this happened to us, we are worldly. That is the so-called the life of the flesh, passion and desire, which becomes we are an enemy of God, although we profess that we are children of God. Ellen White, in a long paragraph, says that in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, pages 513 and 14, says, The will must be voluntarily yielded to Christ. It is for you to yield up your will to the will of Jesus Christ. And as you do this, God will immediately take position and work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. The whole nature will then be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. And even your thoughts will be subject to Him. You cannot control your impulses, your emotions, as you may desire, but you can control the will and you can make entire change in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, your life will be hid with Christ in God and allied to the power which is above all principalities and powers. You will have a strength from God that will hold you fast to his strength. And a new light, even the light of the living faith, will be possible to you. But your will must cooperate with God's will. What a statement. We need to have such. And so, we need transforming grace. The will is the governing power of the nature of man, bringing all other faculties under its way. The will is not the test or inclination, but it is the deciding power which works in the children of men unto obedience to God or unto disobedience. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 513. So, in fact, this is what Ellen White says, we want transforming grace of God to take right hold of our thinking powers. We may think of evil. We may continue to keep our minds upon objectionable things. But what does this do for us? It conforms our entire experience to that which we are looking upon. But by beholding Jesus, we become changed into his likeness. So the servant of the living God sees to someone some purpose. Eyes are sanctified, ears are sanctified. Those who will close their eyes and ears to evil will become changed. Mind and personality and character, 670. So the question here is, who controls the will? In a statement in High Calling 107, Ellen White says, What kind of will I am individually cultivating? Have I been gratifying my own desire? Confirming myself in selfishness and obstinacy? If we are doing this, we are in a great peril for Satan will always rule the will that is not under the control of the Spirit of God. When we place our will in unison with the will of God, holy obedience that was exemplified in the life of Christ will be seen in our lives. So, when Satan is permitted to mold the will, he uses it to accomplish his ends. He stirs up the evil propensities, awakening unholy passions and ambition. He says, all this power, this honor, and riches, the sinful pleasure, I will give it to you. But his condition are that integrity shall be yielded, consent blunted. Thus he degrades human faculties and bring them into captivity of sin. It is so important that we need to understand what happened to our will. In fact, there is a conflict between righteousness and righteousness. We can only be successful only with divine aid. Our finite will must be brought into submission of the will of the infinite. The human will must be blended with the divine. This will bring the Holy Spirit to our aid and everyone 
every conquest will tend to recovery of God for chase position to the restoration of the image of the soul. So, but the infinite sacrifice of God in giving Jesus his beloved son become a sacrifice for sin, enable him to say without violating one principle of his government. Here is the appeal of Jesus. Ellen White wrote it in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 515. Jesus says, Yield yourself to me. Give me that will. Take it from the control of Satan, and I will take possession of it. Then I can work in you to will and to do of my good pleasure. When he gives you the mind of Christ, you, your will becomes his will, and your character is transformed to be like Christ's character. So how crucial is then our mind? We need a constant sense of ennobling of power of pure thoughts and the damaging influence of evil thoughts. Let us place our thoughts upon holy things. Let them be pure and true, for the only security for any soul is right thinking. Are we used to use every means that God has placed within our reach for the government and cultivation of our thoughts? We are to bring our minds into the harmony with his mind. His truth will sanctify us, body and soul and spirit. So the principle of planting and harvesting is here. According to Paul in Galatians 6, verses 6, 7 and 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, he will reap. For he who sows, to his flesh will flesh he reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will reap the spirit of everlasting life. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow. They who sow win, they shall reap a will win. So this is really whatever we sow in our mind, whatever we plant it, whatever we deposit, the same we withdraw and cultivate, we harvest. So how important is this mind in following God's will? In Rebion Herald, April 8, 1884, uh, Ellen White says, For every class of temptation, there is a remedy. Every class of temptation because the devil has millions of species of temptation. But the assurance is that we are not left to ourselves to fight, battle, serve, and our sinful nature in our own finite strength. Jesus is a mighty helper, never feeling support. But the mind must be restrained not to allow to wander. It should be trained to dwell upon scripture, upon noble, elevating themes. Portion of scripture. Even the whole chapters may be committed to memory to be repeated when Satan comes in with his temptation. When Satan would let the mind to dwell upon earthly and sensual, he is most effectively resisted with it is written. This is the reason why one of the most efficient way of stopping sin is memorizing the Bible by verses, by chapters, because when you memorize that, that is, it is written. Your mind changes into the mind of God because the scripture is the mind of God. This is the important way how we put inside the things that are so important. There is an intimate relation between the mind and the body. And in order to raise a higher standard of moral and intellectual attainment, the laws that control our physical must be hidden. Anything that lessens physical strength enfeebles the mind and makes it less capable of discriminating between right and wrong. Having through the role of the will and mind, following God's will, we are now going to discuss the will of God for the followers of Jesus. Meaning to say, I have discussed. We can only follow God's will when our will is surrendered to God voluntarily so that He can work with our will 
through His Holy Spirit, then we can fulfill God's will. I just mentioned four or five stated will of God. So the consequences, the consequence of following or obeying God's will is what? According to Matthew 12, 15, Jesus says, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. That is the highest privilege and honor to be belonging to God's family. Again, what Jesus says, Whoever does the will of God, that is my brother, my sister, my mother. Meaning to say, we are connected with the Lord because we do the will of God the Father. So let me state one. For this is the will of God. By doing good, you may put silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 2.15 Because many people are asking what is the will of God. Now, I'm reading at least five, four or five stated will. What is the will of God? Doing good. Number two, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God. Again, it's number two, the clear will of God, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. This is God's will. In one text, there are three. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Number three, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. Here, the will of God is holy life, a life of sanctification. Now, the four is not stated, but this is what Jesus says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Daily, Luke 9, 23. Okay? Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So, here is the will of God, and let me explain it one by one. Okay? No one enters heaven without doing God's will. You must fulfill everything. But if that is your will, the door of heaven is closed. So we need to use the power of the will and mind either to choose His will or not. But it is non-negotiable. No other option. So how crucial is the consequence of not following God's will? Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Have done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never know you. Depart from me. You practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 23. Did you understand? That is prophecy is a highest office. Casting demons. Do many wonders. But these are not the will of God. Because the last verse, depart from me. I do not know you. You practice lawlessness. Meaning to say, what is lawlessness? Violation of God's law. So, how, how crucial is it? That's why no one can go to heaven without following God's will, obeying God's will. In fact, 1 John 2, 17 says, And the world is passing away, the last of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So this is very important, my brothers and sisters. To me, the will of God is between life and death. If I cannot follow and obey His will by His grace and His power, heaven is shut up. And that's why Jesus says, it is our highest privilege to become a mother, a brother, a sister when we do God's will. Doing good. Let's start a simple will of God. For all Christ followers, this is the will of God. Doing good. Can we do good with motive without anything strings attached? Can we do good with anything that no ayuta, no title of ulterior motive? 
no selfish interest or looking for something, just a breath of a needle as a reward? Has not the Lord commands his follower, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works to glorify your Father in heaven? Matthew 5, 16. Doing good. But our good are calculated. Our good, there is an element by which we want that is too subjective. We want to do something good because in return we get something. That is not. That is not. Because the motive is wrong. We must do good because God is good. The problem with the unconverted mind is that the good works are for our own glory and praise. We got those things that belongs to God and take them to ourselves to be glorified. So instead of shining, we turn dim towards God. Even though we are told our works in the end of themselves has no merits, we deserve no thanks from God. This is Ellen White, our high calling. So doing good is the will of God. So while we are on earth, everything we try our best by His grace who empower us to do what is good. Why? We must do good for God is good. This is the way reflecting His character. But does the Bible say many times to do good, maintain good works? Why? Because Paul has the answer. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10, meaning to say, before creation of human, God has already planned His beforehand. We are created for good works. Before eternity, before this planet was created, before human, there was already a plan. We should do good works. Our good works alone will not save us. But we cannot be saved without good works. This statement is volume 4. Page 228. We must do work because that is the motive of God why He created us. So true Christian must be ready for every good work. And those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good work. This is Paul. This is an imperative. In fact, it urges to let our people also to learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 14. Good works is God's will for us, but this good work has nothing to do merit with salvation. Meaning to say, we must execute and do God-pleasing, God-glorifying good works. Because good work teaches that a saved person, efforts, or work cannot be separated from God's infilling empowerment to fulfill good works that are God-pleasing, God-glorifying. This is the good work in God's will. That's why we find this in Paul. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Philippians 4.13 To this end, I also labor striving to his working, who works in me mightily. So good works are a result of God's work with man's willingness and cooperation. Did the book of the Bible say that? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that man may be complete, totally equipped with good works. Second Timothy 3.16, that's part of inspiration. We need to do good work because this is God's will. Good works apart from inspiration and revelation, therefore good and pleasing to God. But used to profit something related to salvation is almost unpardonable sin. So Christians should do good works because God is good. And all good comes from God. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from God, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of accepting shadow. James 1.17 When we accept Christ, good works will appear as fruitful evidence that we are in the way of life. And that Christ is our way 
and we are treading the true path that leads to heaven. Review and Herald, November 4, 1890. Good works are works of faith and spirit-filled, empowered action that requires human efforts and cooperation. So good works are saving relationship. The presence or the absence of saving faith in our hearts are shown by the presence of the absence of good works of our love, of our of love in our lives. Good works are not the ground of our salvation, but the fruit of saving relationship. All our good works depend on a power outside of ourselves. Although the fruit is produced in our lives, it is the fruit of spirit, not man's fruit. When the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Holy Spirit. What are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Joy, love, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 23 There is a fatal deception and treason. I know why it says. Let no one take the limited, narrow position that any of the works of man can help at least possible way to liquidate his death of his transgression. This is fatal deception. No, every good works cannot cover of our transgression. This is fatal. Faith and work says Jesus imparts all powers, all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith. Which is the gift of God? If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man and then present to subject to angels acting apart in the salvation of human soul or merit, the position will be rejected as treason. That's a quite startling statement. Anything we do and when we present that even to angels, angels would declare that it is treason against God's government because good work can only be produced when Jesus is in the heart, when the Holy Spirit is empowered by that person and he can provide. Let's go to the other. Good works. Now, you see, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God. These three are life essential of a Christian. At a glance, they are opposed to the normal nature. For who could rejoice always? This is especially in the time of acute crisis, in the times when everything seems against you, in death and life situation, when you lost everything. This is possible for God told Paul. Job did it. The second could be very possible. What quality of prayer? Because it says, pray without ceasing. But I'm questioning what quality of prayer has been uttered? Lip service prayer? Fervent prayer? Earnest? Importunate prayer? This is the reason that I said only real born Christians can do the will of God. So these three, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Our circumstances, occasion. Alter them all until we submit to God what is our will. God demonstrated this tree in Paul's life. Listen to his testimony. I rejoice in my suffering for you. He's the only one who can do that. We can rejoice too when we run into problem of trials for we know they help us to develop endurance. This is important. In times of suffering so much Rejoice. That's why he, he can see that again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and peace of God surpasses all understanding. Will guard your hearts and the minds through Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, verses 4, 6, and 7. So this is a very important. In fact, if you try to look at Paul, there's so many other Records, but let's go to First Corinthians chapter six, verses four to ten. In all things, we commend ourselves as minister of God. In patience, in tribulation, in distress, in strife, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labor, sleeplessness, fasting, long suffering, by the Holy Spirit, sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness of the right hand and on the left and honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceiver, yet true, 
as unknown yet well known as dying we behold as alive and chasing not killed sorrowful always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich having nothing yet possessing all things can be done rejoicing prayer giving thanks regardless of what happened this is the will of god that's why the will of god is opposite to our natural nature the third the will of god a life of holiness this is the will of god your sanctification for god did not call us to uncleanliness but holiness why sanctification or life of holiness is the will of god because the biblical foundation is very clear on this concept the sacredness of man whether he or knows it not beside man is the temple of god and the temple and god cannot dwell by faith in the person who are not holy or not sanctified do you not know that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of god god will destroy him for the temple of god is holy which temple you are first corinthians 3 16 and 17 we understand that well, so what is the will of god our body is the temple that's why this body should live a life of sanctification what is sanctification it is living cleansing from sin and live a life becomes holy because only the holy spirit of god and the spirit of christ can only dwell in a person who believes that his body is holy and therefore there is a call for a life of holiness sanctification is setting apart for a holy purpose self-consecration to a secret or religious use it is cleansing from sin making pure and holy which is impure and unholy we are called to be holy or sanctified life this is paul what he says in second timothy 1 9 he has saved us and called us unto a holy life it is a living a life being blameless faultless holy before god in the world just as he who called you is holy so be holy in all you do for it is written be holy because i am holy we are called to that that is god's holiness we are not called to be worldly we are not called that's why he says make every effort to live in peace with everyone to be holy without holiness no one can see the lord hebrews 12 14 this is god's will opposite to holiness is worldliness a life of continual sinning right so i have repeated that making friendship with the world is enmity against god whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of god this is a life of holiness do not love the world or things in the world if anyone loves the world, the Father is not for him, but for all the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away and is lost. And anyone who does the will of God abides forever. Therefore, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails it for him, it is in James 4, 17. So it is the entire surrender. Ellen White has a beautiful expression. What is sanctification or holiness ellen white says it is an entire surrender to the will of god it is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god it is doing the will of our heavenly father it is trusting god in trial in darkness as well as in the night it is walking by faith not by sight it is relying on god with unquestioning confidence and resting in his love. Acts of the Apostle, page 51. So a sanctified life is a condition ready for translation to God's kingdom. God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit. The one who sanctifies us is the Holy Spirit. And the belief of truth according to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely that you may whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace to Thessalonians 4, 5, 23. So, let us live an excellent philosophy of life. Many of us have our own philosophy, but not biblical philosophy. 
so that we can do, we can obey, fulfill God's will. Ecclesiastes says, I know nothing is better for them than to rejoice, to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. This is the gift of God. This is the will of God. Remember that word. Rejoice, do good in their lives, eat and drink, enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of God. Meaning to say, the will of God has been expressed long time ago. In a clear way of life. Again, this is, has been repeated. The expression has been repeated. It means, he be impasses to be obeyed. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink. To enjoy the good of his labor with his toil under the sun all the days of his life, which God hid him. For it is his heritage. As to every man to whom God has given riches, wealth, given him power to eat, to receive his heritage, rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. So, when we do everything that is good, labor, we enjoy because it's a gift of God, we can rejoice. It says, for he will not dwell unjoyly in the days of his life because God keeps him busy with a joy in his heart. I think we find that with Paul. It is this philosophy of life, not the expression, it's not the expression of God's will. Certainly they are. Rejoice, do good, enjoy. The labor is a gift of God. Then when you work, God will provide you riches and wealth and power because this is from Him. When our will is submerged to God's will, our mind is submits, submitted to God's will. It returned to us, purified and sanctified. That's why all our works, as the scripture says, is a gift from God. Whatever is your work. When we serve him, we are admonished that to do the following. Trust the Lord, do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, it's not to men, knowing that the Lord will receive a reward from inheritance for you save the Lord. Colossians 3, 23-24. I beseech therefore you, brethren, by mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your responsible service. Serve the Lord with godness. That is God's will. Let's go to the last. Jesus following God's will. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Father who sends me. John 5.13. Can you do that? He can do nothing because Jesus followed God's will both in his work and his work. Listen to what Jesus says. I do nothing of myself, but the Father taught me I speak the things. I have not spoken on my authority, but the Father who saves me. Uh, and give me a command. What I should say and what should I speak. Get that? Jesus really is following God's will. And as a model, he did not speak all the words you find that in written in the gospel. That is not his word. That is the words of the Father. And the, and the works that he performed, that is the work of the Father. Because he emptied himself. So look at that. Even my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. John 17, 16. The works that I do is not mine. It's the Father. I bear witness of me. It is the Father who dwells in me, does the work. And that is our Wrong conception. Because many I have heard, Jesus performed all this one, but without looking on this text, Jesus has done nothing of himself, his word, his work, because he did follow God's will. In his perfect submission, that's why Paul says in Philippians, he emptied himself. Born of a servant, he was God, but he emptied himself so that he will follow God's way. What are the things that he emptied? His omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence while on earth as babyhood to adulthood. 
he totally depended on his father. When he went down with them in Nazareth, subject to his mother, kept all these things, and Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God. That is spiritual and with men, social. Meaning to say, he emptied himself. He knows everything. He was the one who spoke the entire Old Testament. But now he is a baby. He emptied himself. When he grew up, he started to learn wisdom. He grew up, spiritual things. He grew up. He emptied himself. That is following God's will. That's why in Gethsemane, we find him. Father, if it is your will, take up this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours will be done. Luke 20 to 14. Again, he repeated that. Let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but your will. Matthew 26, 39. Oh, Father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. In Calvary, demonstrated in the following God's will for him. It was a life of faith, fully surrendered to God the Father. It is a showcase of God that those who follow and obey God's will will understand that it can only be accomplished by God's grace through total surrender of self, and God can work to will and to do. God cannot work in us when self is not denied. Self is a core hindrance why God cannot work His power. To follow God's will means dying to self and living for God. Is walking in the narrow way. Many people are believing Christian, but there are many Christians who think they are that because they just walk together. Many are thinking they are now walking in the narrow way because the narrow way is God's will. Denying ungodliness, worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in present age. Purify himself for his own people, jealous for good works. My brothers and sisters, it is important. Our prayer should be, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. And then I delight to do your will will be our constant prayer. There is only one issue in life, which we have to follow our will, the enemy's will, or God's will. Only this, ma only this thing matters. Nothing else in a Christian life. And so I want to end. We can only follow God's will if our will, our mind, becomes the mind and the will in harmony with Jesus, empowered by His Holy Spirit, transformed, and this will do good works, rejoicing always, praying always, giving thanks regardless of circumstances, and we deny ourselves as we follow Jesus, we fulfill His will. May the Lord bless you as we meditate because Jesus says, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is my prayer.